Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today, we're delving into real life stories so creepy and terrifying, they've made people's blood run cold. Prepare yourself for a spine tingling journey into the unknown, and don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoy the video. I was approximately 5 meters away from my younger brother when he slipped at a public pool. He went forward, hitting his head on a metal bridge, and then went backward, hitting his head on the concrete. His skull was visible, but fortunately, I didn't witness it. He had to be taken to the hospital, while I went to a friend's house who had been with us that day. You don't want your 10-year-old child to witness something like that. He now has an impressive scar that is slowly starting to fade. This incident occurred about 7 years ago, and since then, they have removed the bridge that used to go over a whirlpool to the center island. It's my most distressing memory, but he can't recall it. I was driving with my mother and my ex from Strasbourg back to Switzerland, and I was in charge of the GPS navigation. The system directed us through a small mountain pass in the Jura region, right on the border between the two countries. As we ascended the pass, it suddenly started snowing heavily, and it was late at night, with an eerily empty road. The car was struggling a bit, mainly because my mother hadn't bothered to change the tires for winter. Nevertheless, we were slowly making progress and re-entering Switzerland. Eventually, we reached a more open, two-lane road descending from the pass, with slightly more traffic. Despite the heavy snowfall, the presence of other cars made the situation a bit calmer. It was at this point that the car began to skid. We veered up an embankment on the right side of the road, and the car fishtailed, turning at a 90 degrees angle and blocking both lanes. The moment of real fear came when the entire right side of the car started to lift off the ground. You could feel your weight shifting down into the seat, and the outside view began to tilt sideways. Fortunately, it stopped shortly after, and the car settled back on all four wheels, but it was a moment I definitely don't want to experience again. Another memory that comes to mind, I may have mentioned it in a previous post about military accidents, was during live fire practice with our tanks in the Swiss Army. I was assigned as the loader that day, responsible for reloading the shells after each shot and clearing the bin of spent casings. On this particular occasion, one of the rubber rings in the cannon burst when we fired. Normally, when the main cannon is fired, special ports on the outside expel the smoke from the shell combustion, leaving the inside compartment smoke-free. However, this time, it seemed that the individuals responsible for cleaning and replacing the rubber rings made a mistake, most likely, they didn't position it correctly or accidentally pinched it between two screw-on plates, causing damage. As a result, the pressure caused the rubber ring to burst, and smoke poured out of the same vent holes used for the smoke expulsion. Picture me standing there with a 25 kg tank shell in my hands, being enveloped in choking smoke and unable to do anything. Keep in mind that we had to keep the hatches closed, so the smoke had nowhere to escape except within the turret casing. We later discovered that there was nothing inherently wrong, but it was certainly a terrifying experience for me and the crew. An ex-friend of mine suggested that he, a mutual friend, his brother, and I go tubing down a river that we later found out was way too cold and way too full. So we go and buy these crappy $20 inflatable lay down raft things, as well as an inflatable beer cooler that you tie to your raft. So we all get into the river, and almost immediately everyone hits one of the giant boulders that litters the bottom but can't be seen. So everyone goes under, and we lose the beer within 3 minutes. I wear glasses, and of course they get ripped off my face, luckily, I was able to get them somehow, I'm super blind without them. In that instant, we all realized this day was no longer about fun but rather surviving. This water is so cold that every time it hits me, my whole body shrivels, and I can't breathe at all. I have to do a crunch, so I'm sitting up enough to see what's coming and using all my strength to paddle. If I don't paddle, I end up floating backwards, hitting a rock, and I'm in the water again. So my adrenaline is going like I'm on the sharpest edge right now. I eventually got the hang of staying oriented, seeing where I'm going, and learning to deal with smacking my ass super hard on every boulder in that river. I haven't seen any of the others in at least an hour. So a gigantic rock formation on the right hand side appears, and I try to steer away, but the faster moving stream leading into this formation catches me and taxis me in. It's like a path between two rocks, and one curves to the right, causing the path to curve to the right. Under the curved rock is water flowing violently. In trying to get out of the faster stream, I get swept out of my raft and get slammed against this log that's up against the rock where the water is flowing underneath. My raft is nowhere to be seen, I'm being sucked by my legs under this log and using all my arm strength to keep from going under. I'm fucking terrified and am like 2 hours into a full-blown, non-stop adrenaline rush. To my right, 
The water is calmer, but there's no real way to get over there without pushing off this log using my arms, and I'm afraid the suction will take me. I sat here for what seemed like 30 minutes. Finally, I work up all my courage and push off. Surprisingly, there's no suction, and I'm into the calmer water, and there's my raft. So I get in it and try to go back out into the water. My dumbass gets caught up in the faster stream again and slams into this log again. I push off again, knowing I can. Instead of taking the water, I climb up on this rock that has no foothold except for this one inch edge. The whole thing is covered in algae. This part is hard to describe, but to get from this rock up into the woods, I have to move from this rock to the left to a set of two rocks with a four foot crevice between them that drops down at least 10 feet. I got over and was one hand and leg on one and one hand and leg on the other above this 10 foot drop. There's a rock at the bottom that is on a slight decline. My muscles are already tapped, so I'm starting to slip, so I jump. I land on the rock, but it's wet from the water, and I slip and bang the shit out of my leg. There was no lasting damage, but it really hurt at the time. Oh, I have my raft with me, mind you, an inflatable one. So the vegetation up here is just bushes covered in spikes, spikes that could pop my raft. So I trek through this crap, busting everything down with my bare hands to leave room for myself and this raft. It takes me, like, 40 minutes to finally get back to the water. I felt a sense of relief that I was out of that brush until I got onto the water and remembered, oh yeah, I'm more likely to die here. So I'm back on the water, doing all the same stuff. Wondering how far out of town I was, I thought I was close by now, I wasn't. I get to this really shallow part of the water where the train tracks go over the water. I get out and find a hobo village that's empty, and I'm like, well, I guess I'm sleeping here. And like the voice of God, I hear my former friend yell my name. I yell back, and he comes running down this hill on the other side of the water. I chuck the raft and run over to him. Everyone had already gotten back together. Two guys had hypothermia, and I had just cuts, a fucked up knee, and sore muscles, I don't work out so really sore. We go and get pizza and go to his place, where I pass TF out. I have a low form of PTSD from this, where if I feel like I can't control my footing, I freak out a little. I went hiking and was walking down a rocky slope when I started slipping and felt all the same feelings. Yeah, it sucked, but at least I survived. It taught me a little about myself, though. It's easy to say how you'll react in a situation like that. I found out who I am in those situations, and I feel secure in it. During my university years, there was an anarchist squat near my place. It was along the route from the bus stop to my home. One day, someone in the squat decided to get a Rottweiler. Although I had always been somewhat afraid of dogs, I had managed to handle them in my adult years. However, this particular dog didn't like me. The first time it saw me, it charged towards me, barking aggressively. I panicked and froze. It came within two meters of me, barking continuously and slowly approaching. For a moment, I thought this might be how I meet my end, succumbing to a half-remembered childhood phobia. It reinforced my fear. Luckily, the owner intervened, called the dog back, and held it. I quickly left. Similar incidents occurred a few more times, prompting me to take action. While mustering the courage to approach the squat owner and acquaint the dog with me, I started taking a detour when walking home from the bus stop. This detour added about 10 minutes to my journey, but it felt safer since I was avoiding the dog. Then, one day, as I walked past the stadium, I spotted the dog observing me from a distance. It stood near the corner on the opposite side of the stadium, quite far away, but it began barking and approaching me. I knew I wasn't visible from the squat, so there was no one to rescue me. In that moment, I genuinely feared for my life. Fortunately, the dog didn't close the distance completely, it eventually stopped. I continued walking. Eventually, I completed my studies and left shortly thereafter. My three-year-old had a seizure last year. He's never had one before, and I've never seen anybody have a fit in my life. He was sitting next to his brother watching TV, and I glanced over at him, and he was quite happy. Two minutes later, I saw that he had slid slightly down the couch, it was so quick and subtle that his brother didn't even notice. He was stiff as a board, his eyes rolling up in his head, and only his hands and wrists were shaking. I stayed calm and called an ambulance, making sure that nothing was near his head to hurt him. By the time the ambulance arrived, his skin was turning a mottled color and his lips were a little grayish, but I still stayed calm even though my blood had run cold. He was completely fine afterwards, he'd had a slight cold and his temperature spiked too quickly, but I'll never forget his older brother's terrified reaction when he realized what was happening. I'm a delayed panicker, get the job done and panic later, and when we were at the hospital and I knew he was alright, I broke down in tears. He slept it off, 
and I took him home. I'm sure I've been more frightened than this before, but a mother's fright when their kids are in danger is quite another type of fear. It's raw. When I was around 16, I walked through some shops in a small historic downtown area to sell ad space to businesses for my high school newspaper. Since I didn't have a car or a license at the time, my mom dropped me off and parked elsewhere, occupied with reading or something else. Between two shops, there was a guy asking people if they wanted to play tic-tac-toe. He seemed to have some sort of social and or learning disability, but I wasn't sure. He approached me, but I had to decline since I needed to continue visiting businesses to meet my quota. As I walked down the street, he began following me, which didn't initially bother me, it seemed like a coincidence. However, when I entered a store, he followed me inside. This started to make me uneasy, so I tried texting my mom to ask about her location, but she didn't respond. I decided to enter the next store, and once again, he followed me inside. I didn't even engage with the store owner, instead, I walked toward the back of the store, out of sight, looped around, and left. I don't believe he intended to harm me in any way, but the experience of being followed without anyone around to help or even notice was truly terrifying. It's a feeling that I still have recurring nightmares about. When you're surfing, you need to paddle through the breakers to reach the unbroken waves you want to ride. While paddling out, waves typically break either in front of you, allowing them to release most of their energy so you can dive underneath, or you can push through the wave before it breaks if you're quick. The worst scenario is mistiming your paddle and finding yourself underneath the falling lip when it hits, taking the full force of the wave's energy. Another way to deal with this is by paddling wide of the break to avoid the waves, a strategy commonly employed by surfers when they can predict the wave patterns. I was surfing at Lennox Head, a point break near the university, on a day that was probably too challenging for my skill level. The waves were around 6 feet on the smaller ones and at least 10 feet on the main sets. I got pounded on the rocks while paddling out, but I managed to catch a few good inside runners and smaller set waves, which were amazing. However, as I was paddling out again, a massive set swung wide, and everyone in the lineup started paddling for the horizon. My heart was racing, teeth clenched, and I just barely made it under the first wave, which was about 12 feet of heavy, dark blue water. The undertow grabbed me a bit, but I shook it off and kept paddling because the waves were coming in sets of five that day. I paddled hard for the second wave, and again, I just made it by the skin of my teeth. However, this time, the undertow grabbed me more forcefully and pulled me out of position. The third wave was a monster, filling my entire field of vision. It was so dark and heavy, and as I paddled hard, I had a moment of self-doubt, I thought I wouldn't make it. I debated whether to wait for it to break or ditch the board and head for the bottom. In that moment, I froze mid-stroke and couldn't move. I was in trouble. Realizing the situation, I snapped into action, paddling as hard as I could. Unfortunately, that moment of hesitation sealed my fate. The wave crashed onto my back, and I didn't stand a chance. I was knocked off the board, pushed down to the bottom, and then carried up and over the falls multiple times. Eventually, I managed to swim to the surface, only to be hit by the whitewash from waves 4 and 5 right in the face, which sent me back down and dragged me hundreds of meters down the point. This incident occurred during my senior year of high school. I was sitting at a table with my friends during lunch, chatting about typical teenage topics. One of my friends, whom we'll call Jade, was dating someone named Adam, who I found a bit quiet and creepy. On this particular day, Adam joined our conversation and was joking around with the rest of us. As I turned to speak with another friend, a loud slap suddenly grabbed everyone's attention. We all looked at Jade and Adam. Jade was holding her cheek, and Adam, in anger, was pulling on his jacket before storming off. I couldn't help but ask Jade, did he just slap you? She nodded, tears in her eyes, and replied, yes, he did. It's fine. This happens all the time. The school bell rang, and as our group comforted her while heading to class, I decided to stay behind. I couldn't let this go, so I headed to the school office. I approached a lady at the front office with a friendly smile and explained in hushed tones that I had witnessed a friend being struck by her boyfriend. Her smile vanished, and she immediately called security, saying, hello, we have another report of a female student being assaulted. After a short wait, a female security guard arrived to escort me to the principal's office, where another security guard was ready with a notepad. They asked for my name, Jade's full name, Adam's full name, details of the incident, and if anyone else had witnessed it. I confirmed that a group of us had seen it happen, and the principal excused me to return to class. I'm a reserved person and don't usually seek confrontation, but I asked not to be identified as the one who reported this and requested a note from the nurse to make it appear that I had been in her office. Back in class, 
I realized that I shared this period with Jade, who sat right beside me. Her cheek was red, and she was still crying, with our teacher gently inquiring about her well-being. I handed her the note discreetly and coughed to make it seem more believable. About five minutes into the class, the office called Jade to go there. I was anxious, but she didn't seem to suspect anything, grabbing her belongings and leaving without a word. Nothing significant happened for the rest of that day. The next morning, I woke up to numerous texts and missed calls from my friends. I assumed it was trivial, got ready for school, and headed there. As I arrived, I saw around five police cars and officers with dogs. My mom asked what was going on, and I had no idea, so I went inside. At our usual gathering spot, none of my friends were there, which struck me as odd since the bell was about to ring in five minutes. I called a close friend to find out why she wasn't there. She informed me, didn't you hear? Adam posted a thread on Facebook, saying he was going to bring a gun and kill Jade and all her friends for breaking up with him. While I wasn't too scared, given the presence of police and dogs, I decided to call my mom to inform her. She came to pick me up before the first period had even ended. I never saw Adam again, but according to people who were closer to Jade than I was, the police had visited his house to investigate. They found a gun in a safe, but his father claimed he didn't know the code, which I find hard to believe. Unfortunately, Jade got back together with Adam, seemingly guilted into the relationship. I sincerely hope she eventually ends things with him, for her own safety. After working a late day I was heading back to my apartment. I was a 20-year-old newlywed and was not used to the drive to our new home yet. I was low on gas so I stopped at one that didn't have an inside area. Just a stall you pay at. I pay and go back to my jeep. No one else but me there. I see movement in the corner of my eye but had my hood up so wasn't sure what it was. I turn my head and the older man that worked there was coming up behind me. He said something about hiding my face and started to reach up to push my hood back. I froze. Didn't know what to do or how to act and was pretty sure I was in some real big danger. Blood running cold was the perfect description for how it felt. Right then I see headlights coming in. He walks back to his stall. I leave. 15 years later and I'm a totally different person who would not only not put myself in that situation but I also look out for anyone else who looks like they feel that same way. I decided to go to sleep early one night. I hopped into my bed, door closed, lights off, pitch black room. The only sound was from my small fan by my bedside. Time passes. I toss and turn, but I can't go to sleep because the thoughts in my head torment me. Not literally, but I was thinking too much to sleep. I decided that the fan was too loud and switched it off. Time was 2 a.m. to 3 a.m. I go back to my bed, lying on my back, staring upwards into the darkness. I closed my eyes and tried to go to sleep. The silence. I don't know how to explain it, it was dead silent, nothing. Even the movements of my body were muffled by my blankets. It was such a heavy silence. I became frustrated because I wasn't able to sleep. But I kept my eyes closed and turned to the other side of the bed, and that's when I heard it or them. Just a muffled, high-pitched voice in my head. It couldn't make out what it was saying, and it didn't scare me either. But one thing is for sure, I fucking heard it with my ears, even though I was sure it was inside my head. Spoilers, I didn't sleep. I was trying to sleep at night when I heard voices inside my head. I once attended my aunt's birthday party, which took place in a mountain hut at an altitude of about 1,500 meters. There were around 30 of us, enjoying fondue while the adults indulged in white wine. I was underage at the time, so no wine for me. At one point, I needed to use the restroom, so I ventured outside around 11 pm. It was quite dark, but the temperature was comfortable enough for me to think, why not walk about 200 meters to that group of trees, relieve myself, and enjoy the view down the valley. So, I did just that, under the stunning night sky, surrounded by silence. As I was about to return to the hut, I thought I saw some movement about 200 to 300 meters away. The nearly full moon had just risen over the ridge, casting a silhouette that allowed me to identify the figure as a canine. I thought, probably a shepherd dog from a neighboring farm, given the handful of sheds and houses within a kilometer. When we drove up, we hadn't seen any lights or signs of habitation. I considered it might be a fox, as judging the distance was challenging. Or perhaps, a wolf. I remembered hearing about a wolf sighting in this valley, which had supposedly been a regular occurrence for the past five years. I'm not saying I saw a wolf, but my heart was racing, and I hurried back to the hut. I didn't run because it didn't seem threatening, in fact, I wasn't sure if it even knew I was there, and I didn't want to lose sight of it. By the time I reached the hut, it was still wandering through the meadows like a canine, but it was harder to spot due to the hut's lights. Eventually, 
I gave up and went back inside without mentioning it to anyone. Later, I asked my uncle, who owned another farm in the valley, if he had ever seen the wolf and what he knew about it. He mentioned seeing it a few times from a distance, but it had never posed any threat. Regardless of whether it was a wolf or a dog, I felt incredibly vulnerable in that moment. It's frightening to realize how limited and inadequate your senses are in the dark compared to most animals. This creature could have easily harmed me if it had wanted to. Despite that encounter, I still have a deep appreciation for wolves. They are now making a comeback in my country, and I am firmly in favor of their presence. However, I'd prefer not to encounter one alone in the dark. I checked the National Wolf Register, and the same area is still marked as presence of one or a few individual wolves without forming a pack. My mom has cervical pain, and about two years ago, she was prescribed very strong medications to alleviate the pain. One night, around 2 to 3 a.m., I heard my mom let out a single shriek before falling completely silent. I rushed to her room to check on her, only to find her fast asleep. I tried waking her up by calling her name and gently shaking her, but she wouldn't respond. After attempting for about 5 to 6 minutes, I began yelling to rouse her, but she remained motionless. Panicked, I checked her pulse, which was so faint that I couldn't feel anything. It took me about a minute to realize that something might be seriously wrong, but I didn't give up my efforts. Tears welled up in my eyes, and I was in such shock that I didn't even think to call for help. Just as I was about to lose hope, she suddenly woke up and began crying. I celebrated life like never before, giving her a big hug, even though she had no idea what had just occurred. I had a dress fitting for my sixth form ball, I'm 18, and the tailor, a middle-aged Middle Eastern man, gave me a gift bag and a card after the final fitting. The unsettling moment was when I opened the card and discovered it contained a declaration of his undying love for me, along with a request for a weekend getaway. He even referred to me as his beautiful princess. I didn't open the bag, I simply tossed everything into the backseat of my car. My anxiety deepened when I realized he had my home phone number, which, if searched, would reveal my full address, my dad runs a business from home. It became even more concerning when I recalled that my dad had mentioned their upcoming trip to take my brother back to university during our last visit to the shop. My brother and dad returned the card and gift bag to him, and I didn't hear from him again. However, I couldn't shake my unease throughout the entire time they were away. I may have been overreacting to the situation, which is likely the case, but I had always refused to visit the man's shop alone from the very beginning. My mom came with me once to meet him and reassure me, and when we got back, she also told my dad that I should never go there alone. When I was around 18 years old, I found myself home alone while my parents were out in London for the night with our neighbor. I heard some strange noises coming from the back garden, so I looked out of my window but couldn't see anything. Trusting my instincts, I decided to approach my other neighbor and said, I know this may sound strange, but I've been hearing some noises outside. Would it be okay if I went into your garden to get a better view of mine? They kindly agreed, considering it was late and dark, and I still couldn't spot anything unusual. Upon returning to my house, I peered into the kitchen and noticed that our sliding glass doors were shut and locked. Feeling relieved, I proceeded upstairs to my bedroom and took one last look outside. To my shock, I saw a man wearing a mask lying on top of the extension of my neighbor's house, the same neighbor who was out with my parents. He had some sort of weapon, possibly a crowbar, and was looking directly towards where I had just been in the neighboring garden, lying flat to avoid being seen. I had no idea about his intentions, but he hadn't noticed me, even though I was only five feet away. Fortunately, I had connections with some local police officers, so I made a direct call to one of them. Within minutes, there was a significant police response, which, in hindsight, seemed quite unnecessary. However, the intruder had disappeared, leaving only his footprints in the snow. For a month or two, my family and I lived in a haunted apartment. Every night, particularly after 1 a.m. when everyone else was asleep, I would hear the hallway creak. It occurred at two specific spots when someone was walking there, accompanied by the faint whispers of what seemed like a young boy and girl. I ruled out other possible causes like noise from neighbors below us or voices from outside through open windows. I observed that I could only hear these sounds when I remained quiet, any noise, even the slightest movement in my bed, would make them stop. At one point, I began to doubt my sanity and moved closer to my door to listen carefully. I confirmed the eerie noises were real. I couldn't make out exactly what the whispers contained, only catching certain words. I can't recall the specifics since this happened years ago. It was incredibly frightening to the extent that I started taking sleeping pills to doze off early, just to avoid hearing those unsettling noises. I'd also keep all my lights on and lock my door. Initially, 
I witnessed things moving, but exclusively within my room. My clothes swayed, a stool in my room trembled ever so slightly, and my window sounded as if someone was knocking on it. Furthermore, my little brother, who was around four years old at the time, began sleepwalking during these months. It was particularly terrifying because he would come to my room and attempt to open my door in the middle of the night. The culmination of these events occurred one night when I was lying in bed. I must have fallen asleep without realizing it when I suddenly heard a loud noise in the house. I got up to investigate, but something invisible tackled me to the floor, its weight pressing down on me as if it was trying to enter my body. It was a horrifying experience, I felt immobilized and couldn't utter a word. The pressure continued to intensify, and I felt increasingly weak. I resigned myself to the fact that I couldn't fight it off, and I thought I would have to allow this entity to take control of me. However, in that moment of vulnerability, I turned to prayer, even though I had become skeptical of God over the years, despite my Christian upbringing. As I began to pray, I felt the weight gradually lifting, and I realized it was working. I continued praying, and as the burden lightened, I managed to form coherent words. As the weight decreased further, I screamed, get off me. The entity finally relented, and I was able to get up. My immediate instinct was to run to my mom's room across the hall. To my surprise, she was awake, and I shared the terrifying experience with her. She had previously doubted my claims about paranormal activity, but as I spoke to her, I glanced back at my room and saw a dark figure pass from there to the living room. After that, I woke up suddenly at 5 a.m., feeling bewildered. My surroundings were exactly as they had been in the dream. Strangely, after this dream, the energy in my room felt different. I no longer felt the fear I had experienced before. From that day onward, everything returned to normal. The paranormal occurrences ceased, and my brother stopped sleepwalking. This experience profoundly changed my beliefs. I had always believed in ghosts, but now I have a stronger conviction in their existence, and I am also more afraid of the dark. A complete loss of electrical power on board a submarine. You've never seen anything so dark. We were running a drill that would bring down part of our obviously redundant electrical plant. Some guys had messed up with some maintenance on the emergency lighting system. Long story short, a watchstander fucked up pretty badly during the drill, and no one stopped him. We lost all AC power, and the DC power emergency lights didn't come on. The darkest I've ever seen in my life. Bonus story, running another drill is underway. We lose propulsion for this drill, the guys who drive the boat know this is coming. They made a pretty bad mistake driving the boat, which caused us to lose large amounts of momentum. We suddenly found ourselves at a very odd angle, with no propulsion. Captain screams over the announcing circuit, secure from the drill, get me fucking propulsion right the fuck now. Commence scurrying of the engine room and the fastest recovery from that drill I've ever seen in my life. This was quite a mix of scary videos, a stormy night, and my dog Nana. One night, I couldn't sleep, so I decided to watch some spooky videos on my phone, featuring ghosts, spirits, and demons, hoping it would help me fall asleep. After a while, I turned off my phone and tried to get some rest. For a while, everything was fine. I was in a deep sleep until I started dreaming about the creepy stuff I had watched earlier. I got a bit scared, especially with a storm raging outside and my room plunged into darkness. To calm myself, I reached out with my foot to find Nana, my trusty companion in situations like this. She usually sleeps at the foot of the bed on the right side, while I sleep on the left. However, she wasn't there. Perhaps she had gone outside. So, I found myself alone, trying to shake off the nightmare. Suddenly, I felt two claws on my back, running from my upper back down to my spine. I went ice cold, every hair on my body stood on end, and I was about to scream and leap out of bed. That's when I heard a long snore and realized who the real culprit was. It turns out, for the first time that I could remember, Nana had decided to sleep just like a person, with her head on the pillow and her body parallel to mine. She was really close to me, and when she stretched, it made me think there was something eerie behind me. She really got me that night. Some time ago, I was commuting to visit my grandparents in a developing country using public transportation, and I only had a backpack with me. Both my phone and wallet were in my bag because I didn't have any pockets. While I was on the bus, I wanted to listen to music, so I reached into my bag but couldn't find my phone. My cousin thought someone might have stolen it from my backpack, but that seemed odd because they didn't take my wallet, which was right next to my phone in the bag. I thoroughly searched my backpack, but it was nowhere to be found. I wasn't terrified because I had lost my phone, I was terrified because of how my mom would react. She would be very upset. Losing it while on vacation would be even worse, 
and she would also scold me for not being careful and keeping it in my backpack while commuting, where it could easily be snatched. As it turned out, I had actually left my phone at my uncle's house. I thought I had taken it with me, but I hadn't. The strange thing was that it ended up in a place where I would never have intentionally placed it. I once dated a Laotian girl who came to the US with her mom when she was three years old. We spent a lot of time at her house during our late teens since her mom was pretty laid back about supervision. This allowed us to do typical things teenagers do without much oversight. However, something eerie about her house caught my attention. I could point to a specific spot and feel like something was watching us. One night, she had friends over to stay, and they asked about her little sister, even though she didn't have one. Her friends claimed to have seen a little girl walking around the night before. Intrigued, I asked her mom about it once, and her response was unbelievable. She said the entity's name was the Laotian word for misery and that it had followed her from Laos. Despite feeling creeped out, I wasn't scared until one particular night in July. I had moved out of my parents' house and into town with some friends a few blocks from my girlfriend's place. After college one night, I took a detour through her neighborhood. It was warm, but there was a sudden downpour. Just after I rolled through a stop sign in her neighborhood, I saw something unusual in my mind's eye, a dark figure beneath a streetlight on the corner. I turned around to investigate. I first headed in the opposite direction from her house for some reason but then turned around and went past the stop sign toward her cul-de-sac. As I drove by her house toward the end of the cul-de-sac, an intense feeling of fear overcame me. My hair stood on end, and I felt nauseous. This was all before I actually saw it. At the end of the cul-de-sac, which backed up to a long park, there was a gate leading to a path. When my headlights passed over the end of the cul-de-sac, I saw a figure with paper white arms sitting in a casual, reclined manner. It wore all black clothing and had long black hair covering its face. As my headlights swept over it, it lifted its head and revealed a blank, pale white face. I screamed and sped out of the cul-de-sac as fast as I could, then called my girlfriend to come to my house. That night, she experienced sleep paralysis and heard a voice asking if she thought she could escape just by staying at my house. Yeah, that was a terrifying experience. This was more of an anger-driven situation, but it still applies. My blood ran cold, and my entire body went numb. I had been working hard for five and a half months at a small pub slash restaurant. I was the only full-time staff member, working six days a week and essentially running the place. I handled every task involved in running such a place, except for accounting. This included taking deliveries, thorough cleaning, serving customers at the bar and in the kitchen, and working as a waitress. I even handled minor repair jobs, all without complaining. Two weeks before my six-month mark, my boss handed me a written report, assuring me that I'd secure the job permanently as long as I maintained my performance. Later that week, the boss's husband came downstairs while I was taking a quick break for a drink, given the hot weather at the end of August. He questioned why I wasn't working and began listing additional tasks I should be doing. I explained that I had already completed them, but he seemed unsatisfied. He eventually left, and I returned to straightening up the glasses behind the bar since the place was empty. Five minutes later, he returned and said, if you're not going to work, you may as well go home, but if you leave, you won't be coming back. I didn't respond and simply stood there until he went back upstairs, continuing my work until the end of my shift. The next day, I arrived at work to find everything bright and cheerful. I headed into the kitchen, ready to start meal prep, and discovered another letter. As I read it, my entire body went numb. The boss's husband had informed my boss that I had contemplated leaving after our exchange the previous day, which I had, honestly, and now, every mistake I had ever made while learning the job was held against me. I was no longer offered the permanent position unless I worked twice as hard. It felt like emotional blackmail, and my thoughts were reduced to white noise. I could hardly breathe, and my body shook. I felt as if I had been doused with cold water after running a marathon. I genuinely thought I might be sick. I wrote a letter stating that I was quitting, apologized to the regulars at the bar, the part-time bar girl, and simply left. Two weeks later, I received a phone call from my former boss, attempting to charge me for some chicken that had been left out of the freezer. One late afternoon after work, I went to a local supermarket for groceries. While I was loading my car, a grocery bagger offered to help, and despite my polite decline, he insisted. I asked him how he was, which led to an unexpected conversation. He started ranting about current news and expressing strong opinions about Democrats while continuing to load my groceries. As he talked, I stood there, nodding politely, feeling socially awkward but not wanting to be impolite. Then, he began discussing the topic of taking someone's life, mentioning a prior incident with a dog and insisting it was different. 
At that point, I realized it was time to leave. He became increasingly detached from our conversation, looking away and talking to no one in particular. I eventually contacted the grocery store and spoke with the manager about the incident, sharing what had transpired. Unfortunately, she dismissed it, citing the bagger's mental condition and her personal knowledge of his family situation, even denying any history of owning a dog. Unable to find closure in the matter, I switched to a different grocery store and never returned to that one. I was at a shop with my three-year-old daughter. While the cashier rang up our bill, my daughter wandered deeper into the store to check something out. After paying, which took about 10 seconds, I went after her but couldn't find her. Although it was a small shop with a few long aisles, I searched for a moment, called out, and then rushed outside to call for her. There was an elderly Chinese man by the entrance, so I asked him if he had seen a little girl. He shook his head, but I wasn't sure if he understood me. Our apartment is on the sixth floor, while the shop is on the ground floor of our building. With no response when I tried to call my spouse, several minutes passed, and panic started to set in. I was terrified. How could she have vanished? I had only looked away for a brief moment, and I knew where she had gone. How could she disappear like that? I sprinted up the stairs to our apartment, as there was no elevator. When I arrived home, guess who I found inside, grinning at me? My daughter. It turned out that she thought she knew the way back home and had gone on her own. She must have retraced her steps through one of the aisles to the shop's entrance, noticed I wasn't there anymore, since I had gone to look for her, and decided to head home. I experienced an immense sense of relief. We had a serious conversation with her about not wandering off without either her daddy or mommy. We had told her this before, but we emphasized it even more this time. I was in the back of a pickup truck when someone fell out and died. I was at a friend's house, and a truck pulled up. My friend and I hopped in the back. We didn't know the driver or the guy in the back, but we knew the guy riding a shotgun, and we were all going to the house of a guy we all knew, so we figured it was cool. Once we hop in the truck, the driver speeds off, the short streets with corners were the only thing keeping the truck under 40 miles per hour. Once we got on the main road, he was doing about 70 in a 45. I dove down in the fetal position, holding on to the inside of the truck, but the guy I just met was acting reckless. The driver got to the next intersection and turned left from the right lane, cutting across three lanes. Eventually the guy was back to speeding, and this time the new guy was standing up in the truck with one leg on the toolbox and both hands in the air. I thought he was about to die. Finally, we are almost there, and the driver made a wrong turn, so we are turning around in a neighborhood. It was then, when the driver was actually doing the 20 mile per hour speed limit and the crazy guy was just sitting on the metal toolbox, that he slid off the back of the truck. My friend and I started pounding on the back window, yelling, man overboard. When the truck stopped, my friend and I hopped out and ran to the guy who fell out. A pool of blood was already appearing in his head. We called 911, and a bunch of cops, medics, and highway patrolmen showed up. The driver got arrested for DUI, and my friend and I were the only ones that didn't go to jail or the hospital. One of the cops gave us a ride up the street to our friend's house, and of course the moron has a bong on his windowsill, so we told the cop it was the next building down. About a week later, I was getting ready for school and thought it would be a good idea to tell my mom the story, and when she didn't think it was the merry adventure that I did, I tried to tell her I made the whole thing up. Just my luck, there was something in the paper that day about the guy that fell out of the truck dying in the hospital. But what really makes my blood run cold is when I think about how if the driver didn't turn left in the right lane, if he turned right, the only other way to get where we were going would have been to get on the interstate, and that might have killed all of us. Probably last year, in November, I had a really good night's sleep. This is the first time my baby has slept all night since she was born in October 2016. I woke up to 30 missed calls from my mom and sister and texts saying my dad had been taken to the hospital at 3 am I got up and dressed with the baby and set off to the hospital. It just so happened that day that the snow was so bad it took a 10 minute trip to the hospital 2 hours. When I got there, my dad was in the ICU. I sat with him all day and most of the night, telling him how much I or we loved him. The next day, I dropped my daughter off at my in-laws and went to the hospital with my mom and sister. When we got there, we got into a side room with a consultant, and he explained how weak my dad was and that they would not be able to put him in a coma as he would not survive the ventilation. All they could do was sedate him to make him more comfortable and let him go. It was the most heartbreaking moment of my life. Luckily, they gave him some sedation, and it made him relax so much that he was able to build up his strength to breathe more easily. He got stronger every day, and we finally got to take him home again on Christmas Eve. It made me realize how much I would miss my dad if he were to die. He has been doing really well and has stopped smoking, 
which caused him to be there in the first place with COPD, and things are looking up. A little late, but one night about 10 years ago, when my dad was on a business trip, a car drove up our driveway and parked in front of our house. My mom and I were up watching TV in the living room when we saw the headlights turn off the highway, and we both kind of looked at each other like what the fuck? Because we lived in the middle of nowhere and couldn't think of a reason why anyone would be visiting so late. Someone got out of the car and knocked on the front door, so my mom got up and, without opening the door, asked what the person wanted. The guy on the other side told my mom that he needed to use the phone because his car had broken down on the highway. This immediately alarmed my mother because we'd watched him pull up the driveway in his car. She noticed the door wasn't locked, so she locked it before she answered and told him we didn't have a phone he could use. The guy literally didn't say anything in response, got back in his car, and drove away. The scariest thing about this experience for me is that not only was my dad gone and the door hadn't been locked the entire time, but I was just thinking about what the guy really wanted to come in for if his car obviously wasn't broken down. I still get chills thinking about it years later. The occasional email sent to the wrong person with sensitive data, the wrong text, etc. would do this to you. But nothing ever scared me like the event below. My son was sick. He was about 15 months old. We had just put him down for the night when he woke up just 20 minutes later, crying. My wife and her sister-in-law took him outside for some fresh air, and I followed shortly after. As I got hold of my son, he started convulsing. This is important because, had I not gotten hold of him, he would have fallen from the trunk to the road. I hold him, and I freak the fuck out. I am a very calm person, but this is my son, and suddenly I am out of control. I tell my wife to dial 911, and she does so. All this while, I am looking at my son and just talking to him, hoping to somehow fix him. His eyes were rolled up. He was making hiccup sounds. He was seizing. At the time, I did not know what seizures were. Had I known, I probably wouldn't have been so scared. The 911 op tells us to set him down, take off his clothes, and lay him on his side. As I did so, he stopped convulsing and exhaled. For a moment, I thought my son had passed. I let out a very soft no. Two minutes later, the firefighters were in our home, and my son was taken to the ER. He is okay. But those few minutes of my life were the most terrifying. It's traumatizing even today to talk. And I don't think I can communicate the level of fear I felt. I used to struggle with heroin addiction. Towards the end of my drug use, finding a suitable vein became challenging. I thought I had located a good vein in my wrist. However, for those unfamiliar, the wrist is generally not recommended for injection due to the risk of mistaking an artery for a vein, as arteries are close to the surface here. Unfortunately, that's exactly what happened. I only pushed in slightly, around 3 units, and instantly, I felt an intense, burning sensation shoot up to my fingertips. It was the most excruciating pain I had ever felt. The pain came in waves, with a fiery sensation for about 15 seconds, followed by a brief relief of about 5 seconds before it returned. This continued for approximately 5 minutes. But that wasn't the worst part. Within about a minute of this incident, my hand swelled up to about 3 times its normal size. The swelling occurred so rapidly that I feared it might burst. I couldn't even close my hand. After some frantic one-handed internet searching, I discovered that the consequences of this mistake could potentially lead to amputation. I panicked and immediately went to the hospital. After enduring a few hours of waiting in the emergency room, they provided me with aspirin and wrapped my hand with a compression glove to reduce the swelling. Thankfully, the swelling subsided after about two days. This moment was undoubtedly the most terrifying experience of my life, and it was entirely self-inflicted. I apologize if this story doesn't perfectly align with the title, but it's the closest I have to share. Back in December, I visited the Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum in Weston, West Virginia. First of all, Let me say that from what I've read on Reddit, I must have been to the better part of WV because I loved it, everyone was kind and not a redneck. Second, I should also say paranormal stuff interests me, and visiting the massive psychiatric hospital has been on my bucket list for some time, since about 2008, so I was excited. Throughout the night, I heard strange noises and voices, but three incidents stood out. The first was while standing in the dark, empty corridor alone with my mom. We'd taken a public tour, and a handful of people showed up, there were maybe 10 people per floor. All of a sudden, a loud droning siren screamed throughout the whole building, it was very similar to the alarm in Silent Hill. It's not paranormal, as we'd been briefed earlier that the town's historic curfew siren would go off once early in the night. It was still quite surreal when it happened, and I got goosebumps. Second, while on the fourth floor, 
I walked past a doorway where the guide claimed to have seen the apparition of a female patient wearing a hospital gown crouching in the doorway on a separate investigation. I heard a hushed woman's voice call my name, but nobody was around. I eventually came back to the spot and felt tingly all over, then my camera died. As it was charging, I felt completely exhausted, like I was ready to pass out, and it was only about 12.30 am. I wasn't tired before or after. Once I went back upstairs, I entered the room where I thought the voice came from and where I felt tingly, and I shut the door. Minutes later, both my mom and I heard a low, deep growl from the hallway. Nobody was in the hallway besides my mom, and it was near the end, my mom was in front of the door. Finally, we were on the second floor near the end of the night. I wanted to go explore one area when my camera died. I tried the spirit box, which has been featured on TV with Ghost Adventures, and it's something I've had success with in the past. It mysteriously malfunctioned. So we decided to pack up and head out. All of a sudden, we heard footsteps rapidly advancing down the corridor toward us. My mom hurried out of there, but I looked behind me with the flashlight and saw nothing. Completely silent. I'd have to say that the Trans Allegheny Lunatic Asylum is one of the most haunted places I've been to and have visited. I might save up for the private overnight investigation, so just a few friends and I can go, but it's costly. So when I was in fourth grade, my parents started to let me walk myself to school instead of being dropped off an hour early since it was a minute walk. They would always leave around the same time as each other. I would lock the door right behind them, so they knew it was always locked. So this day, I remember saying goodbye, locking the door, and getting ready to leave. I would have to leave through the garage so that the front door would stay locked until they got back home. For whatever reason, I was putting my shoes on by the front door when I heard my mom, loud and clear, tell me, hey, Sir Death, come upstairs. My dumbass declined to answer back, and the moment I put my foot on the first step, I froze and clutched the rail tightly. Whatever was calling me called me to keep walking. I have never felt that amount of dread and fear from an unknown entity again. I grabbed my bag, frantically unlocked the door, and ran down the street. Now this is where it gets a bit more complicated. According to my grandma and aunts from my mother's side, something has been following us since way back when my grandma was a little girl in Mexico. Their side of the family has too many paranormal incidents, from having people appear in houses or apartments to very few people, people appearing in photos, people missing moments of time, blanking out or literally going missing, and having possessions go missing that were only ever known to one person, for instance, jewelry that was passed down and kept in the attic that can no longer be found despite never moving. If I ever bring up the slightest detail from that day, GMA will stop the conversation right there. She has repeatedly asked us to never bring it up and never acknowledge that voice. I've brought it up to aunts, uncles, and cousins privately, and each one still, from time to time, hears someone ask them to go somewhere where they would be absolutely vulnerable. Sometimes I wonder what would have happened had I listened to it. I had a pretty paranormal and terrifying experience about a month ago. I know it will sound far-fetched, but I tell you, it's true. Sorry for the long story. So I work a pretty shitty job at a restaurant bussing tables all day, and it's repetitive and not enjoyable at all. So I get home on Sunday after my shift and immediately go down to take a nap. Now keep in mind that I started this nap in the middle of the day. I wake up about 10 hours later, and it's completely dark and eerie. At the time of this event, I wasn't really fond of my parents, as they were both really strict and took away my privileges often. This time, they took my phone. So I'm laying there trying to fall back asleep while facing the wall, my back is to the rest of my room, when I physically feel a cloud of darkness and despair fall on me. Like the previously moonlit corner I was in, it became shrouded in darkness. After the darkness fully surrounds me, I proceed to receive these horrible and disturbing visions that I knew I could never imagine myself having. I felt like the devil himself was trying to telepathically speak with me. I heard a voice promising me power, and all I had to do was kill the parents I supposedly hated. And I imagined a long black arm painting a symbol on my forehead. I eventually shook off this feeling of dread with enough concentration, but afterwards I felt like there was something behind me in my room. Like the manifestation of all my fears was there behind me. After about 30 minutes of fear and panic, I gained the courage to turn around and look. Obviously, there was nothing there. But I still felt very uneasy, and I didn't sleep for the rest of the night. This actually happened a few weeks ago. My brother, grandmother, and I went to a restaurant. I can't remember which one, but I remember my mom telling me that we were never allowed to go there with my grandmother again. Here's why. It's not the worst thing to ever happen, but it did spook me a lot. We ordered some spicy onion rings, which I didn't eat because I hate spicy food. My brother and grandma eat most of the thing, 
which already made me a little nervous, knowing my grandma might not be able to handle such spice and she may get sick. She seemed fine, and I ordered a soup after. I ate my super cool chicken nuggets, and my brother had some pasta. I remember now that the restaurant was out back. I remember talking about how un-Australian the place is. Anyway. Cut to the end, my brother orders the check. About three seconds later, my grandma started throwing up on the table. That wasn't the part that made my blood go cold, but I was close to it. I handed her a bunch of napkins to help clean it up. A manager came over and started helping us clean everything up, being super fucking nice. Ken tenths manager. I take my grandma to the car while my brother pays the bill and helps clean up. As soon as we get in there, she drinks some water and seems fine. She starts apologizing like crazy, and I keep telling her we were fine. My brother comes back into the car and starts driving. About a minute later, my grandma starts throwing up again, but into her purse this time. My brother pulls into a parking lot, and she gets out. The moment my blood ran cold was the moment she started throwing up a lot and was beginning to choke on it. I did my best to calm myself down and carefully did the choking help thing, where you wrap your arms around and push. She stops throwing up and stops choking. I have some vomit on my arm. That's fine, I didn't care at the moment. She threw up some more, I called my mom, and we brought her home. She stopped throwing up and felt fine a few hours later. So, uh, yeah. Don't take your 75-year-old grandma to Outback and get spicy food. It doesn't go well. I guess I'd never thought that I would have to do the Heimlich Remover at age 14, but here we are, y'all. Edit, Heimlich Maneuver, not Remover. I don't care, I wrote this right after waking up, and I knew it was wrong, but I didn't have the mental strength to Google it. Oh yeah, all is well with my grandma. I'm hanging out with her right now, and we're going to Cracker Barrel for dinner. Hell yeah. Carol is doing great. To the best of my recollection, my childhood home had always been haunted. Strange occurrences happened sporadically, but there was a period when things took a turn for the worse. My older sister and I shared a bedroom, and there was a time when we both struggled to sleep due to horrific nightmares and mysterious nighttime noises. To ease our fears, we began sharing my queen-sized bed instead of her twin bed. My bed was positioned against the wall, which was connected to our garage. One night, my sister abruptly woke me up, whispering, do you hear that? I sat up drowsily, listening in silence. Then, I heard a loud bang, as if someone had forcefully struck the wall behind my bed. Moments later, another bang came from a different part of the wall. I sat there in disbelief as yet another bang echoed from another section of the wall. Our bedroom door was open, revealing a view across the hallway to our parents' room, with their door closed. The banging continued, so my sister clenched her fist and began punching the wall in response. After she finished, we both sat in silence, waiting to see if there would be a response. While we sat there quietly, my cell phone began to ring. I thought to myself, who in the world is calling me at this hour? It's worth noting that this incident occurred around 2004 when Nokia phones were popular. I crawled over to where my phone was charging on the floor and noticed my sister's cell phone displaying my number. I turned to my sister and said, your cell phone is calling me. Her phone was charging right next to mine on the floor, and she had one of those flip phones that required manual opening to dial out. Somehow, her closed phone had managed to call mine. She looked at me in confusion and then climbed over me to reach her phone. Sure enough, my number appeared in her outgoing calls. We hastily left our room. It was incredibly eerie how everything happened simultaneously. We never did uncover the source of the banging on our wall, which occurred from the upper right corner all the way down to the lower left. The fact that it reached up to the ceiling made us doubt it was caused by a person. Additionally, our garage door remained locked and closed throughout the incident, and we never heard it being opened or closed. When we rushed out of our bedroom, it woke our parents up, confirming that it couldn't have been them. When I crashed my car back in 2010, I was on a dirt road going about 60, hey, fuck it, 9 feet tall, bulletproof, and invincible, and I hit a pothole. The back end of the car kicked up and sent the car into a sideways drift. In that instant, it hit me that I was in some serious trouble. The primal fear of what I'd just gotten myself into kicked in, and I experienced time dilation. Everything appeared to be moving at half speed, and I could see there was absolutely nothing I could do to recover the situation. The car violently swerved back the other way and was headed directly towards a huge white pine tree with a bunch of thick dead branches hanging off it. I cranked the wheel as hard as I could to try and get one more swerve out of the car and avoid becoming a shish kebab man. The car entered a small ditch right in front of this tree, and the rear wheels got hitched to a culvert. This pole vaulted the car straight up and away from the tree at a slight angle. Now, 
This is where time really slowed down. I was upside down, 10 feet in the air, flying into the forest at mock Jesus. I could see the sun through the branches and little pools of light in the vegetation. I also saw where I was going to land, on a massive boulder. The slow motion sensation left, and my car smashed into this boulder upside down, crushing in the entire roof, aside from the driver's side. The car rolled down the boulder and landed right side up. I'm pretty sure I blacked part of this out, but I just remember snapping back into reality, convinced I'd been seriously injured. There was absolutely nothing wrong with me. Not even the slightest indication I just neoed my way around death. My best friend was driving behind me and came sprinting up to the car, also convinced I was dead. He saw me looking around, kicked the door off, and started checking for injuries. He told me not to move anything until paramedics got there to assess me. I didn't really register much, aside from how lucky I'd gotten. I didn't really eat or sleep much the next week, either. This also happened to be one of the few times I'd ever decided to wear a seat belt. That, no doubt, saved my life. What also got to me was that if I'd had any passengers, they would have all died. The only part of the car that didn't resemble crushed aluminum foil was the driver's seat. That's what hit me hardest, my best friend, who ran to check on me and that I'd known since preschool, could have easily been sitting beside me, a victim of my stupidity. Now I buckle up and drive like a granny. I might get there late, but at least I'll get there. I had an experience during Hurricane Sandy that made my blood run cold. We'd lost power for a week, and all of our phones were dead. My family members decided they were going to go to a relative's house to charge up and shower, etc. This was during the time that I was rather into smoking, so I took it as an opportunity to have a nice smoke, enjoy the quiet house, and read for a bit. I stayed home. So I take my dog for a walk, do my thing, and everything is cool. It's pretty windy, but there's no rain at the moment, and it's midday, so the neighborhood is pretty empty with most people at work. As we approach the house, I notice a guy standing on the curb across the street from my house, wearing a scarf or mask covering the bottom half of his face and holding a chainsaw. Immediately I get a little nervous because there's no one else around, and hello, paranoia, but I don't think anything of it and keep walking towards the house. Just as I'm about to set foot on my property, he fires up the chainsaw and starts power walking towards me. Not quite jogging, but brisk, and right at me. I freak the fuck out and hustle my poor, old, overweight dog into the house with my heart beating out of my chest. I barely make it, and he zips past me into the backyard. At this point, I'm freaking out because I have no phone, the house phone is dead, none of my neighbors are home, and my family isn't supposed to come back for a few hours. I stood midway between the back and front doors of the house, armed with a kitchen knife, for a good half hour while my guardian angel dog, who clearly sensed my distress, barked at this chainsaw dude. He eventually went away, I have no idea where, since I resorted to hiding at that point. Later, I was informed by my hysterically laughing family that he had come to get rid of a tree that had fallen in the backyard. Why no one told me, and why he basically lunged at me with an active chainsaw, is a mystery to me. But yeah, I definitely thought I was going to die that day. This happened when I was in 10th grade. We had a milkman who also used to bring his dog, which was as big as a small bear, and that dog used to enjoy sleeping under our car. So before leaving for school, I used to roll a few stones under the car, making sure none of them hit him, and shoo them away. A couple of months later, we had to shift into new apartments, everything was moved, and only my dog was left at our old apartment. It was 5 AM, and as I was walking with my dog towards the new apartment, I heard a growl coming from some distance away, so I turned around and saw this dog running at full speed towards me. My knees and my back just froze, there were no stones or anything I could defend myself with, and there was no way I was abandoning my dog. There was no way my dog could defend me, as that dog was twice as big as my dog and his head was larger than my head. This whole time, me and that dog had our eyes locked with each other while my dog took a piss at the lamp post behind me. After coming within a few feet of me, that dog jumped, opened his jaws, and went for my neck. In my head, I thought, so this is how I die, huh? Just as I lost all hope, I saw a black flash in the corner of my eye, and the next moment, my dog tackled him, throwing him a couple of feet away. But this dog wasn't done yet, he circled behind me and jumped again, going for the back of my neck, but this time my dog got his neck. The next moment was filled with that dog's screams and my dog's growls. He somehow managed to free my dog's grip and ran away with his tail between his legs. I haven't seen that milkman or the dog ever since. 1. My mom, sis, and I were in the backyard eating breakfast at the patio thing. In the backyard, we have these wires that we use to hang clothes. 
On one of the wires were 12 hangers. They are all near each other. Suddenly, a hanger in the middle of the 12 starts spinning. It spun slowly, but it was spinning. None of the other hangers spun, there was no strong wind, just the middle hanger spun. We couldn't believe our eyes. My mom asked if we saw what she was seeing. We answered yes and bolted back inside. 2. When I was 9 to 10, I got pneumonia. My grandmother from another province of our country flew over to watch over my sister and me, my mom was taking the bar exam, which was held in our country's capital. I was admitted to the hospital, and while I was there, my grandmother watched over me. During the first two days in the hospital, I had a reoccurring nightmare of someone banging on my hospital room door trying to enter. On the third night, I had the same dream, but this time. The door burst open. A girl, imagine Sadako from the ring, comes into the room. And I turned to see my grandma, who slept on a couch next to my bed, staring at her too. The Sadako girl leans in close to my grandmother, and I see her whisper to my grandmother. Then I wake up in a cold sweat. My grandmother hears my gasp and wakes up too. She asks me what was wrong. I told her nothing, it was just a bad dream. Then she asks me if I saw the girl too. Apparently, we had been sharing the same dream for the past three nights. In the morning, she has my mom release me from the hospital and bring me home. We later found out a kid in the room next to mine died two days after I left.